Welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we begin our reading of Tyler's Row by Miss Reed. Miss Reed, or the persona she represents, is a school teacher in the Midlands of England in the 1950s and 60s, and she is a keen observer of everything that goes on in her little village of Fairacre. Tyler's Row, Part 1. Outlook Unsettled Chapter 1 Up for Sale Nobody knows who Tyler was. In fact, the general feeling in Fairacre is that there never was a Tyler, male or female. I can assure you, Miss Reed, the vicar, Gerald Partridge, told me one day when I inquired about the subject, that there is not one Tyler in the parish register. It's my belief that someone called Taylor built the four cottages. Taylor, as you know from your own school register, is a very common name in these parts. He rubbed his chin reflectively, a little concerned. I could see about further explanation. The vicar, a living saint, dislikes hurting people's feelings, but is transparently truthful. But Taylor can be so easily debased to Tyler if the diction is at all impure. It must have occurred many years ago, before schooling was so, um, uh, widespread. Exactly. I doubt if it could happen now. I was not in agreement with the vicar on this last point, but forbore to say so. I am constantly correcting pile for pale, tile for tail, arguing about pines of glass, rind drops, and people arriving light for school. The vicar, though, would be most distressed at the thought of casting aspersions on my teaching or the purity of the vowels of my pupils. I'm sure you're right about it once being Taylor's row, I agreed, but it's too late to change it now. We parted amicably. Although mystery surrounds Tyler of Tyler's row, yet the date of the building is in no doubt, for on the end cottage of the four is carved stone bearing the inscription 1763 A.D. In beautiful curlicues, now much weathered by the sunshine and storms of two centuries, but still decipherable. The row of four cottages stands at right angles to the village street and faces south. Under its dilapidated thatch, it drowses in the sun behind a thorn hedge, causing cries of admiration from visitors who are charmed by the tiny diamond-paned windows and the ancient beams which crisscross the brickwork. Pretty enough to look at from outside, I tell them, but you wouldn't want to live there, all four riddled with damp and there's no proper drainage. I expect plenty of people lived happily enough in them over the years, they retort defensively, still dazzled by Tyler's Row's outer beauty. One tenant, years ago, trained the thorn hedge into an arch over the gateway, and this enhances the charm of the view beyond. A brick path, rosy with age and streaked with moss, runs along the front of the row, and there are narrow flower borders beneath the windows. There's no doubt about it. On a fine summer's day, with the pansies turning up their kitten faces to the sun, Tyler's Row makes a perfect subject for a beautiful Britain calendar. After a spell of drenching rain and wind, when the sagging thatch is dark with moisture and the brick path is running with the rain from the roof, Tyler's Row looks what it is, a building fast reaching the end of its days, unless something drastic is done to restore it. Of course, as the besotted visitors point out, it has housed generations of Fairacre folk. Carters and plowmen have brought up their families here, mother, father, and latest baby in one bedroom, girls in the other, the boys downstairs. Shepherds and shoe menders, dressmakers and washerwomen, all have called Tyler's Row home over the years. At one time, at the end of Victoria's reign, there was even a poet beneath the thatch. 
He lived there alone when his mother died for many years, and the older people in Fairacre remember him. Mr. Willett, who is my school caretaker, sexton to St. Patrick's, our parish church, and holder of a dozen or so important positions in our village, told me a little about him. The poor fellow had been christened Aloysius, locally pronounced as Loicious, and was given much given to reciting his works at local functions, if given half a chance. Lived to a great age, Loicious did, com commented Mr. Willett. Well, to tell you the truth, Miss Reed, he didn't do much to wear himself out. That garden of his was like a jungle. The neighbors in Tyler's Row went on something shocking about it. No, he never put himself out much, never even bothered to wash himself the last year or so. Smelt like a proper civet's paradise, that house of his, when they finally came to clear up after him. Aloysius's poems are sometimes quoted in the Caxley Chronicle. In our part of the country, at least, a prophet is not without honor. Occasionally, someone writes a short article about our local poet. The poems are pretty dreadful. He had a great fondness for apostrophes, and one of his better-known works begins with the formidable lines, Ereen falls dewy o'er the dale, mine eyes discern twixt gleam and gloam. It goes on. If I remember, 460 lines with apostrophes scattered among them like a hatful of tadpoles. He were a holy terror at church socials, recalled Mr. Willett. He had old Locius on the platform mumbling into his beard, and you could count on a good half hour getting on with your game of knots and crosses in the back row. Too easy enough to get him up there, but getting him down was murder. They took to putting him on just before the glee singers. They used to get so wild waiting about ca sucking cough drops ready for when you come down the veil, love, that they fairly manhandled Locius back to his chair as soon as he stopped to take a breath. He sounds as though he was a problem, I said. A problem, yes, agreed Mr. Willett, but then you must remember he was a poet, bound to turn him funny, all that rhyming. Well, we was half sorry for Locius, really, said Mr. Willett tolerantly. I've met a sight of folk far worse than Locius, but not, he added, with the air of one obliged to tell the truth, as smelly. When I first became head teacher at Fairacre School, Tyler's Row belonged to an old soldier called Jim Bennett. The rent for each cottage was three shillings a week and had remained at this ridiculous sum for many years. With his 12 shillings a week income, poor Jim Bennett could do nothing in the way of repairs to his property, and he hated coming to collect his dues and to face the complaints of the tenants, most of whom were a great deal better off than he himself. The Coggs family lived in one cottage. Arthur Coggs was, and still is, the biggest ne'er-do-well in Fairacre, a drunkard and a bully. His wife and children had a particularly hard time of it when they lived at Tyler's Row. Joseph Coggs and his twin sisters frequently arrived at school hungry and in tears. Things seem a little better now that they have been moved to a council house. The Waits lived next door, a bright, respectable family who also moved later into a council house. An old couple called John and Mary White, both as deaf as posts, sweet, vague, and much liked in the village, occupied another cottage, and a waspish woman named Mrs. Fowler lived in the last house. She was a troublemaker if ever there was one, and Jim Bennett quailed before the lash of her complaining tongue when he called for his modest dues. The Cogs were moved out first, and an old comrade in arms who had served in the Royal Horse Artillery with Jim Bennett in the First World War begged to be allowed to rent the house. Jim Bennett agreed readily. Sergeant Burnaby was old and in poor health. His liver had suffered from the curries of India when he had been stationed there, and bouts of malaria had added to the yellowness of his complexion. But he was upright and active and managed his loan affairs very well. The waits moved and their cottage remained empty for some time, and then soon afterwards the old couple grew too frail to manage for themselves and went to live with a married daughter. Now the two middle cottages of the row were empty, and Jim Bennett decided that it was as good a time as any to sell the property as a whole. 
Mrs. Fowler at one end and Sergeant Burnaby at the other were not ideal tenants, and the fact that they were there at all must detract from the value of Tyler's row he knew well. But frankly, he'd had enough of it, and he told his sister so. They lived together at Beach Green in a cottage quite as inconvenient and dilapidated as any at Tyler's Row. They sat on a wooden bench at the back of the house in the hot July sun. The privet hedge was in flower, scenting the air with its cloying sweetness. Blackbirds fluted from the old plum tree and gazed with bright dark eyes at the black currant bushes. Old white lace curtains had been prudently draped over them by Alice Bennett to protect the fruit from these marauders. From the plum tree, they watched for an opportunity to overcome this challenge. We'll have to face it, Alice, said Jim. The time's coming when we'll have to find a little place in Caxley, one of these old people's homes, something like that. If we sell up Tyler's Row, we should have enough to see us pretty comfortable with our pensions until we snuff it. You'll miss the rent, said Alice. Her brother laughed scornfully. A good miss, too. Traipsing out to Fairacre every week to be growled at by Mrs. Fowler isn't my idea of pleasure. I'll be glad to see the back of Tyler's row and let someone else take it on. Who'd want it? asked Alice reasonably, with those two still there. We'll see. I'm going into Caxley tomorrow to get Masters and Jones to put it on their books. Some young couple might be glad to knock a door between those middle cottages to make a real nice little house. They won't fancy old Burnaby rapping on the wall one side and Mrs. Vinegar Fowler on the other if I know anything about it. Oh, that's as may be. I'm getting too old to trouble about Tyler's Row. I'm content to take what the agent can get for it and be shot of the responsibility. He knocked out his cherrywood pipe with finality. Alice, knowing when she was beaten, rose without a word and went indoors to cut bread and butter for tea. Jim might be getting on for 80, but there was no doubt he could still make up his mind. And what was more, thought Alice, his decisions were usually right. In no time at all, it was common knowledge in Fairacre, Beach Green, and as far afield as the market town of Caxley, that Tyler's Row was up for sale. No advertisements had appeared, no sales board had been erected, but nevertheless, everyone knew it for a fact. The reasons given varied considerably. Some said that Mrs. Fowler was buying it, having won several thousand from A. Football pools B. A tea competition C. An appearance on a TV commercial What for? asked one wit. Use our face cream or else? Others held the view that the sanitary people had condemned the property and it was going to be pulled down anyway. Nearer the mark were those who guessed that Jim Bennett had had enough and he was selling whilst there was a chance of making a few hundred. The wildest theory of all was put forward by no less a person than the vicar, who was positive that he had heard that a society for the revival of Victorian poetry was buying the property and proposed to open it to the public as a shrine to Aloysius's memory. Certainly, within a week of the conversation between Jim and his sister in the privacy of their garden, everyone knew of the intended sale. He had told his tenants, of course, as soon as he had made up his mind, but they had said little. It was yet another case of airborne gossip, so usual in a village as to be completely unremarkable. Mrs. Pringle, a glumly formidable dragon who keeps Fairacre School clean and who polishes the tortoise stoves with a ferocity which has to be seen to be believed, told me the news with her usual pessimism. So poor old Jim Bennett's having to sell Tyler's Row. Is he? I said, rising to the bait. Some say he's hard put to it to manage on his bit of pension, but I reckon there's more to it than that. There was a smugness about the way Mrs. Pringle pulled in her three chins and the purse of her downward curving mouth, which told me that I should hear more. She put a pudgy hand on my desk and leaned forward to address me conspiratorially. It's my belief he's got something, something the doctors can't do anything about. Oh, really? I began impatiently, but was swept aside. Mark my words. Jim Bennett knows his time has come, and he's putting his affairs in order. By the time that sales board goes up, we'll know the worst, no doubt. 
An expression of utmost satisfaction spread over her face, and she made for the lobby with never a trace of a limp, a sure sign that for once in her martyred existence, Mrs. Pringle was enjoying life. Chapter 2. Prospective Buyers But, amazingly, the board did not go up. While Fairacre speculated upon this, the firm of estate agents in Caxley had informed several clients already seeking country houses that Tyler's Row was now for sale, and they enclosed glowing reports on the desirability of the property. Among those who received a letter from Masters and Jones was Peter Hale, a schoolmaster in his fifties. He sat at breakfast with toast in one hand, the letter in the other, and read hastily through the half-glasses on the end of his nose. Every now and again he glanced at the clock on the mantelpiece. At half-past eight every morning of term time, for just over thirty years, Peter Hale had set off down the hill to Caxley Grammar School, where he taught mathematics and history to the lower forms. He walked the half-mile or so regularly for the good of his health. As a young man, he had been a sprinter and a hurdler, and the thought of losing his athletic figure, as so many of his fellow colleagues had done, was anathema to him. To tell the truth, exercise was something of a fetish with Peter Hale, and his family and friends were sometimes amused, sometimes irritated, by his earnest recommendations of a good five-mile walk or a run before breakfast for any minor illness, ranging from a cold in the head to a wasp sting. His wife declared that he had once advised one of these sovereign remedies for her sprained ankle. It might just have been possible. She was a small, plump, pretty woman with a complexion like a peach. Once fair, her hair was now silvery gray and softly curled. She was very little changed from the girl Peter had met and married within a year. There was a gentle vagueness about her which won most people's affection. The less charitable dismissed Diana Hale as rather bird-brained, which she most certainly was not. Beneath the feminine softness and the endearing good manners was a quick intelligence. Her anxiety not to hurt people kept her sharpness sheathed like a sword in its scabbard, but it was there, nevertheless, and this awareness of the ridiculous and the incongruous gave her much secret amusement. The clock said twenty-five past eight, and Diana waited for the last quick gulp of coffee and the rolling of her husband's table napkin. He tossed the letter across to her and lifted his cup. What do you think of it? Shall we go and have a look? Fair acre, said Diana slowly. Wouldn't it be rather far? Six miles or so, not much more. A lovely country, good downlands walks. High, too, wonderful air. Peter Hale tucked his spectacles into their case, checked that he had his red marking pen safely in his inner pocket, his handkerchief in another, and his wallet in the back pocket of his trousers. So much more convenient for the pickpockets, as Diana had once told him. Must be off. I'll be late back. Staff meeting after school. He gave her forehead a quick peck and was gone. Diana poured a second cup of coffee and thought about this proposed move. She wasn't at all sure that she wanted to move anyway. They had lived in the present house for almost twenty years, and she had grown very attached to it. It had been built early in the century, in common with many others, on the hill south of Caxley. Mostly they had been taken by professional and business people in the town, who wanted to move away from their working premises, yet did not want to be too far off. They were well built, with ample gardens whose trees were now mature and formed a screen against the increased traffic in the road. Diana had worked hard in the garden, scrapping the enormous herbaceous border which had been the pride of a full-time gardener in earlier and more affluent times, and the dozen or so geometrically shaped garden beds which had been so beautifully set out with wallflowers and then geraniums in days gone by. The two long rose beds were her own creation, and a new shrubbery, well planted with bulbs, gave her much satisfaction and less back-breaking work. She would hate to leave her handiwork to others. The house, too, though originally built with accommodation for at least one resident maid, was easily managed. Here she and Peter had brought up their two sons, both now in the Navy, and the place was full of memories. 
and Caxley itself was dear to her. She enjoyed shopping in the town, meeting her friends for coffee, hearing the news of their sons and daughters, taking part in such innocent and agreeable activities as the Operatic Society and the Floral Club. Her nature made her averse to committee work. She lacked the drive and concentration needed and had never been able to whip up the moral indignation she witnessed in some of her friends who were engaged in public works. She admired their zeal sincerely, but she knew she was incapable of emulating them. She knew so many people in the town. After all, Peter was now teaching the sons of his former pupils, and every family, it seemed, had some tie with the grammar school. The young men in the banks, the shops, and the offices of Caxley were almost all old boys and knew her well. Wouldn't she feel lost at Fairacre? She told herself reasonably that she would still run into Caxley to shop and meet friends, but it would mean a second car. She knew that any buses from Fairacre would be few and far between. Had Peter considered this, she wondered, in his desire to get into the country? He'd wanted to do this for years now. Circumstances had kept them in town. The boys' schooling, the convenience of being within walking distance of his work, and Diana's obvious contentment with her way of life. But the boys were now out in the world, the house was really too large for them, and the garden, with no help available, was soon going to prove too much for them. Now's the time to pull up our roots, Peter had said, at least a year earlier. We're still young and active enough to settle into another place and to make friends. I'd like to get well dug in before I retire. He looked at his wife's doubtful face. If we don't go soon, we never will, he said flatly. It's time we had a change of scene. Let's go and look at a few places anyway. During the past few months, they had visited a dozen or so properties, and each time they had returned thankfully to their own home. At this time, estate agents could laud their wares to the skies, and many a desirable residence in charming surroundings could have been more truthfully described as four walls and a roof in the wilderness. Sometimes it was enough to read the agent's descriptions, and the Hales did not bother to visit the establishment. Other factors weeded out the possibles from the impossibles. For example, Peter Hale refused to have anything to do with a property advertised twixt this and that, or as prestige. Listen to this, he would snap crossly, twixt downs and salubrious golf course. And here's another, even worse, a gem set twixt wood and weir. Well, they're out for a start. I'm not living twixt anything. There would be further snorts of disgust. It says here that four prestige houses are planned in Elderberry Lane. Such idiotic phrases. And pandering to the vanity of silly people. Who's going to be gulled into thinking Elderberry Lane's a catch anyway, stuck down by the gas works? They knew the district well after so many years, and Fairacre was one of the villages which attracted them. In open country leading to the downs, it remained relatively unspoiled, yet there were one or two useful shops, a post office, a fine church, and enough inhabitants to make life interesting. This might be a possibility, said Diana to herself, studying the glowing account of Tyler's Rose attractions. Suitable for conversion into one dignified residence, probably means it was falling down and needed prompt support internally and externally. Half an acre of mature garden could be construed as two ancient plum trees past bearing, standing among docks and stinging nettles, and leaded windows would be the deuce to clean, thought Diana. But the price was unusually low. Why, she wondered. Was it even more dilapidated than she imagined? And then she saw the snag. Two of the cottages at present occupied. Hardly worth bothering to go and look then. They certainly wouldn't want neighbors at such close quarters. Still, thought Diana reasonably, it does mean that the cottages are capable of being lived in. Perhaps they would run out to Fairacre after all. And we'll see what they find in Fairacre in more detail next time.